Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Chris Adams. I'm the online community manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Models for Data Requirements. Today's featured speaker is Joy Beatty, Vice President at Sea Level. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the Q&A session at the end. I'd like to say thank you to digibytes.com for sponsoring this event. Digibytes is the online library of solutions for business analysts and technology professionals offering resources from on-demand webinars to white papers and case studies and more. And at this time, I will turn it over to Joy to get us started. Great, thank you, Chris, and welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here with you again. And let me go on here. Um, just a real quick background for you, for those of you I haven't met. Um, I work at a company called Sea Level. I own Sea Labs, which is like our research and development group. We develop methodologies and things like that, our training classes. Um, done quite a bit of work with both IIBA on version 3 of the BA BAC that is now officially out, um, as well as with PMI on their uh, practice guide for business analysis. So. A lot of good fun stuff out of there, and the material I'll present today will mimic a lot of what you will see in both of those and other materials out there. So just let's dive right in. Um, I want to talk today quite a bit about modeling requirements, and so before I dive into that, I think it's really important that we back up a minute and explain what are requirements models in the first place. Um, this up here on the screen is a mumbled, jumbled list of letters that if you look at this list of letters, you may not even recognize that one of them is missing. And if I ask you which one is missing, well, by now you maybe have figured it out because you probably, for the most part, know the alphabet. But imagine this is more complicated, right? It wouldn't be so obvious. So in this particular case, it's not entirely clear that I am missing a letter and even which letter it is until I put some structure to it, right? So this is me putting a model around the information. And if I had given you this grouping of letters in this particular structure, it would have been really obvious that the letter E was missing from it immediately. You wouldn't even have to think about it. You would have just known that. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about models. Um, and now we can translate that to the requirements world. Imagine that each of these letters was an individual requirement. All right. If I think about this grouping of requirements, and there aren't even that many on the screen, how could I look at it and say, am I missing any? Are there any cons inconsistencies in them? It's just not obvious until we put some structure to those. And when we do that, what we're doing is modeling our requirements. So how do we use these requirements models? Well, the first thing is that we're going to fundamentally use them to organize a lot of different information, so large sets of information. Um, and by information, I'm talking about things like requirements, um, business rules, uh, maybe screen information, data sets, right? Lots of different information out there that we use to deploy software projects, and models are going to help us organize those large sets of information. Second thing is that we're going to figure out what's missing. Again, if I'm given a large set of data, it's not obvious to me what is missing in that set of data. This is a limitation of the human brain. We can only process so much information at a time, and so what we need to do is chunk up that information into different sets um, so that the things that are missing jump right out at us. The third thing is that it'll give context to a collection of details. Right? So imagine that I have a requirements spec with 2,000 different requirements in it, and I hand it over to developers, and I say, hey, go build this. That's really hard for them to digest, but if I introduce models into that and give them these visual models, it helps them get some context for it. Um, a very simple example of this is something like a process flow. Really e easy to digest a process flow. To describe that process flow without boxes and arrows, much, much harder, right? So it's, again, giving that context to the information. And then the fourth set of things, it really helps us to focus in on a particular subset of the requirements. This is useful when I'm reviewing requirements with stakeholders. Uh, maybe I want them to only think about one small piece of the information, and so I can use models to figure out that right grouping for them. Now, the thing about models is you actually use them every day, whether you know it or not, whether you call it a model or not. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to me. I was in a conference in Las Vegas. Um, and for those of you who have been to Las Vegas, um, 
when you first get there, it's just loud, and there's lots of stuff going on, and there's like uh, slot machines chinging in the background. And so in this particular case, I think a taxi dropped me off at the registration desk. I was at Caesar's Palace. I walk in, and I walk by the casino to find the registration desk. And I'm standing in line and just already overwhelmed by so many people, so much sound, such a big place, right? It's my turn to check in. And I get up there, I go through the process, and the woman says to me, all right, here's your room number. She gives it to me, and she's like, you know, tells me which tower I am staying in because there's, I think, like six of them. And then she says, let me tell you how to get to it. And she explains, you're going to go right out here past the registration desk. You're going to take a left. You're going to wander your way through the casino. You're going to go past the slot machines on the right. When you get to the restaurant on the left, you're going to go a mile light right. You're going to go past a fountain. At the end of that, you're going to take a left. You're going to go past some shops, and eventually you're going to see the swimming pool. When you get to the pool, there's some elevators on the right, and you're going to take those to your room. And I'm just looking at her. I don't even know what to say because she has just given me about 12 different steps to get from her to my elevators, and I don't remember anything but the first couple. What she did then was say, would you like a map? And she put a map in front of me and very quickly drew a line that described exactly how to get from point A to point B, right? So this is a simple simplification of what that map looked like. That was her giving me a model. There's no way that I would have found, well, I eventually would have found it, but there's no way that I could have repeated back to her all the different steps to get to my room. I would have had to wander around. I would have got lost. I would have taken missteps, right? So that's just a simple, very, very simple example from the real world about how we would use a model to do something. To further make this point, you know, in software development, the system shell statement has, has somewhat become a standard for how we write requirements. I won't go into this in a lot of depth today, but I will just share with you that I actually really just cringe at the words, the system shell. I feel like that's like three or two extra words that we say thousands of times over and don't really need to say. So I, I don't want to digress on that too far, but um, and I will also add that Agile is actually taking it a little bit different direction, which is nice. So that said, what I've got on the screen here is the type of thing that I see delivered in requirements documents time and time again. And you can end up with like a binder full of these on a project where you may have hundreds or even in thousands of system shell statements. And they have little to no organization. The problem is that nobody can really make sense of that. You know, not even the people who are in the middle of the project every day not even the people who are eliciting these requirements and writing them down can actually remember everything they wrote down when you get to the level of detail that we're talking about writing the requirements, right? So I joined a project once that had about 2,000 of these statements written, and the project sponsors brought us in so that we could jump right in and help them start to find gaps in their requirements. And we're looking at this thinking, that's impossible. I cannot just take all this information and figure out what's missing. So the very first thing we did on the project was start to add models to it. So we great that we had our requirements already. We went back and created the models after the fact and then started to map these requirements into the different models. RML is what I like to refer to as a toolbox of requirements. RML stands for Requirements Modeling Language. Um, and it's, it's a group of models that are all meant to visually model our requirements. Uh, now, the thing about it, models are most useful when they focus on only one or two aspects of a system at most. If there's too many pieces of information modeled or the syntax is complex to understand, then the model quickly loses its value. Um, so with that in mind, when we put together this set of what we call RML models, they're designed with the simplest syntax possible that still allows the model to convey the information that's needed. So each model in this language is going to be designed to be as simple as possible and then convey only the necessary information about your requirements. And this is a really important one. It also has to be readable by your business experts and your developers who aren't going to go through a ton of training to learn how to read these. Maybe no training, right? So that's the part. It needs to be easy to consume the, the models that you create. Um, and the models that I'm describing today are from the data models category, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, what I think are really useful data models to help you look at that particular perspective on the system. We classify our models into four different categories. All right, the first one is objectives models. 
these are all about focusing on the value the system is going to bring to the people, to the business, to the customer, whoever is going to need to use the system or is paying for the system. These models are help describing, you know, what problem are they trying to solve, um, what goals are they trying to attain uh, with a particular project underway. The second category, that's our people models. These are all about focusing on who is going to use the system and how are they going to use it. Things like process flows would be a people model. Screen mockups, right? Thinking about how a user is going to interact with the screen, that's a people model. System models are all about focusing on how the systems themselves behave, and, you know, how they interact with one another, what they look like, how they interact um, with the user or the user interacts with them. <laughs> could be either way, I guess. And then our data models, those are things that focus on the information that the end users care about and the life cycle of that information, right? So that's what we're going to focus today is in that fourth category. I will tell you, um, looking at the full set of models, it does take some analysis and some thinking on the part of the business analyst or the product manager to really know which models to use on a given project. We should emphasize that, that sticking to predefined templates um, are always using the same model, won't always lead you to the best results. So know that while I'm going to show you a bunch of different models today, there is no single one model that's always the right model. So quick examples of some of the models um, in each of those categories. Again, each model is designed to be the most simple that it can be while conveying all that necessary information about the requirements. Um, this allows like different levels of practitioners to create them and all the business experts, our developers, our subject matter experts, they can read them. The whole idea here is the use of these models is going to help scale requirements to many different levels of expertise up and down within the organization. There's more models than these and I will show you in a minute a different, like a fuller set of models. Um, but I do want to give you just a couple examples of what I mean by model because I keep referring to models but I think it helps to make sure we're all talking about the same thing when I say the word model. Um, you'll notice that in each of these categories, the top model is actually bolded. Um, the, the reason for that is those particular models actually help us bound the problem space. Um, so for example, if I use org charts where I use those to identify all the stakeholders of my project, assuming I can get a complete org chart for my uh, whole organization, then I know that I am not missing any stakeholders because they're somewhere in that org chart. Okay, so again, those are bounding models to make sure that we know the full scope boundary of the thing that we're trying to analyze. And then all the other models will build off of those. That's one of the ways that we can make sure we're being complete in our systems. I'd like to take a minute. I know a couple people are putting some questions in the question box already. I love that. I will grab those either as we go or later. But take a minute right now and think about what data models have you already used? Which ones do you know about already? And go ahead and put that in the chat box with the question feature. Um, just type in some of your favorite data models. And I'll read back to you what some, some people enter. All right, process flows, class diagrams, oh, entity relationship. I'm going to show you one a lot like that today. Class model, data dictionary, data flow diagrams, great answers. Um, ERD, that's entity relationships, great. Somebody's talked about state tables. They've used them a little bit. Good, we'll talk about those today. Great, activity diagram. There's all kinds of good models. All right, good, good job, you guys. That's a great set. I'm glad to see that. Um, it's funny because I think if I'd asked this question 10 years ago across the general BA population, I think I would have had maybe a little bit different uh, response, like less response. I think modeling has really taken off in a, in a particularly positive way for, for our industry, which I love. It's my passion. I'm excited to see other people using it so much. This is the full set of models when I talk about RML, all the different models that are in it. Uh, some of these will probably look familiar to you even if you've never heard of RML before. Um, and the reason for that is a lot of these models are going to be similar to things that you might have seen in other modeling languages like UML or BPMN, right? BPMN is all about process flows and so you'll see process flows. I put those in the people category. Um, those are popular model and they're popular models within different modeling languages. Ours is going to look really, really similar, maybe a little bit simpler syntax in all these at most. So good examples. All right, we are going to focus today on the things on the far right in that light gray color. <clears throat> Sorry, my slide wasn't transitioning. There we go. So the thing again about data models, a reminder here, this, these models as a collective set are going to demonstrate the data that's involved with the project um, at different levels, from high level down to some really nitty gritty details. Um, and the data models can range from high levels, such as like that business data diagram, 
um, to the more detailed level, a data dictionary would be a really detailed one. All right, before I move on, I see one of the questions that just came in is what is a DAR model that was on the previous slide? That stands for Display Action Response Model. Uh, what that is is a model that takes your user interface screen and very deliberately maps out what are the specific requirements on that screen about how it, the information or the elements of the screen display and also looks at how do the elements behave. So usually when people do UI requirements, they would do something like, here's a screenshot and maybe list out some requirements related to it. This is forcing, this model forces us down the path of thinking about display of that screen and behavior of that screen in a very structured way so that we don't miss anything. So great question about the DAR model. Just wanted to mention that before I dive into these in a bit more depth. All right, the first one is our business data diagram. All right, so the business data diagram, short for BDD, is going to look like an entity relationship diagram or an ERD if you're familiar with that particular model. All right, now the business data diagram, I'm just going to flat out tell you we use a different name on purpose. You can think of it a bit like an internal marketing thing for your business users. What we found is the business data diagram, when we tried to put that in front of business stakeholders and we called it an ERD, their eyes glazed over. That sounded technical to them. They felt like it wasn't their job to look at it. So we renamed the diagram, but used the same shapes, the same concepts. Now the key is that the business data di diagram is going to show the relationship between different business data objects. I'm not talking about physical database design here. I'm not talking about, you know, what your developers think of as data objects there's probably a correlation there, but it's really how do your business stakeholders think about the data? They may think about, I have a customer, I have an order, you know, I have a product, and maybe behind the scenes the technical team is implementing something and they group some of those together or don't group some of those together. That doesn't matter. This is really from the business's perspective, how do they think about the data? Again, BDDs do not help us, um, or they do not model a specific database design. I will tell you that they are a great tool to hand over to the person doing database design. By all means, they will build their models from that. Um, but what they do is they help us figure out some of the things that are missing from the system based on the relationships between these different entities. My very favorite way to use this model is to actually use it to find missing process flows in my set of requirements. So, and that's kind of the third bullet point that's up here. I look at data as having only six things could ever happen to it in a system. It can be created, it could be deleted, it could be edited, it could be used, it could be moved, or it could be copied. And so for every single data object that I model in this, I need to ask the question, well, how was that created? So for example, one of these data objects, let's say it was a physical order in an online store, I would ask, okay, well, how's an order created? How's an order deleted? Okay, and the you answer you may get back is, oh, you can't delete orders. Okay, but you can archive them. Great, I have just identified either a process flow or a user story or use case, which is archiving orders. All right, so I go through that, pro that process really very rigorously, where I ask about these six verbs on each of the different data objects, and it helps me just find some areas where maybe I haven't fully explored the system requirements. And I'll show you an example in a minute here, but this is also a really nice tool to find some of the business rules um, that your business users may not be thinking to tell you about. When we create these, these are the different shapes that are in here. So we have our business data objects in rectangles. Um, that's kind of the, the main component of this particular model. And the key shows you here the different things that can show up on what we are calling that cardinality line. So the line says I've got a relationship between these two objects and the Cardinelli tells me the nature of that particular relationship. So we'll look at an example again in a minute. I think that'll make that more clear. All right. When you're creating a BDD or a business data diagram, I would encourage you to start with just, first of all, figure out what all the objects are and don't worry about the relationships. And I actually like to do this in a brainstorming session with my stakeholders. I would get out sticky notes on a whiteboard and, and literally just start putting them on the board together. And you, you just brainstorm basically what are all the nouns that people talk about on the project. All right, then I think about, okay, how are they related to one another? And after I understand that, I start to think about the cardinality aspect of it because that is by far, I think, the hardest to get right. So here's an example um, of a BDD, we call it. 
right? So this is for an online store. All my examples today are going to be from an online store. Um, so in the middle of it, we have an order. We've got shipping address. You know, we talked about customers' accounts, payment types, the products themselves. Maybe those products belong to a catalog. When I talk about business rules that are buried in this diagram, let me give you an example of that. The um, kinds of questions that I would ask my stakeholders when I reviewed this diagram with them is something like, you know, can an order be shipped to one address only or can it be split across multiple addresses? That right there, that question is describing the, that line between order and shipping address and that number one at the top of that line. We're going to ask, you know, can an order be shipped to multiple addresses? That's a business rule about the system, and I find that answer by mapping out these data objects right now. Okay, another question that might get asked, can a customer use multiple payment types for an order? Right, that's the line from order down to payment type, and right now we're saying there has to be at least one payment type on every order, but there could be more than one, and that's the dot dot n part of it. With that, we're going to move on to the data flow diagram. This is a um, really powerful model that helps us understand sort of the life cycle of data in our system. Real quickly, the syntax for it, the parallel lines with the words up there, that's your data stores. That's where I think of it as places where data comes to rest temporarily within the system. It may or may not equate to databases. Often data stores really get stored in the same database, but we're not worried about designing that at this level. The circles are processes which modify data, the boxes are external entities, and the arrows represent the actual flow of data. Here's what a template for one of these looks like. All right, so um, in this case, the data flow diagram is going to show that flow of the data um, and what changes happen to the data as it goes. So they don't imply a deliberate sequence per se, um, just only the kinds of things that actually manipulate the data, and that's the processes that manipulate the data. In fact, it's really important that you keep data flow diagrams and process flow diagrams or swim lane diagrams separate so that there's no confusion between the two or, or people trying to actually overlay these on one another. That doesn't really work. Um, what I will say is that if you're creating process flows, the names of the process flows are the things that show up inside these circles here. Data flow diagrams are really powerful if you're in something like a transactional processing system or um, like any kind of a system where you have a lot of different pieces of data and a lot of processing going on on that data. It really just helps you visualize that whole life cycle of the data. Um, the kinds of questions that this diagram will answer for you are things like are all of these processes um, or what are all the processes that could update an order? or are these all the data inputs and outputs to each process? So if I have a particular process that a, that a customer is going to go through, I may want to know what are all the inputs and outputs to that. This diagram is going to help me find that. And then just thinking about what data needs to actually physically get stored. That's a great tool for, again, your database designers to understand. So here's an example of a data flow diagram. Um, this is, again, from our online store, and it uses um, Interestingly, elements from other diagrams, right? If I looked at my full set of models for the online store, the bubbles that you see, the circles you see right across the middle of the screen, that's the name of the process flows I would be writing for this exact same system. Now, uh, let me just look at one example of it over here, kind of the second bubble, the login bubble. How you read this is we're saying that when I log into an account or a user or customer logs into the account, the customer is going to send their username and password. It's going to go to the account store data store, which is going to return the account info. Um, to search for an item, so that's, you know, a few more bubbles over, the data object, um, in this case, you know, it's to search for an item, I've got to know what my search criteria is and what my item selection is once I've searched and got results back. So it's not that I'm sending those things in an ordered sequence together, it's just as I interact as a customer with that process, I'm going to at some point be saying here's my search criteria and here's my item selection criteria. Right, so I can understand what the search box or the search process, sorry, needs in terms of inputs would first be search criteria and later be item selection. One of the questions that just came in, Joanna is asking, is the data store a database or a data entity? It may turn out to be a database or a part of a database, but I encourage people to treat this model as a sort of I don't care how that gets solutioned. Um, I'm thinking of it as from a business perspective, they think about storing accounts and storing items and storing carts and storing orders. So good question. Um, 
but I I feel like you as a business analyst in particular really want to try and separate this from a database design. Hope that makes sense. So, good question. Next, we're going to talk about the data dictionary. So this demonstrates our specific, you know, field level data, as I like to think about it. Um, this really gets into all the nitty gritty attributes of a particular business data object. Same thing here. You're going to talk about field names. You may talk about, you know, just different ways that you can name these attributes that may or may not be the same names that the database team uses in the database. We're not saying that it has to be. We're talking about, you know, how again does your customer think about the data being made up? And that's what shows up here, okay? Um, data dictionaries are really helpful when you use them with other models like that business data diagram that we saw first. For every one of those objects, I need to come and do this attribute level definition uh, for each of those objects. So I need to say, okay, customer was an object, what are all the fields that make up a customer? And I would do that in this model. I would not do that in the, the business data diagram itself. So this is giving us a really granular level of detail. The other place that I actually like to tie this particular model to is user interface screens. If you think about it, all the different fields that show up on a user interface screen, those are all just showing data or taking data as input. All of those different fields need to be specified in a data dictionary because there's a lot of rules like business rules that goes around that data and you need to capture it somewhere. So this is a great place to capture the, that detail. All right, this information can um, also, I was gonna say, be identified just by, um, Sometimes it's like talking to the, the teams who understand the existing software. I'm not saying you don't talk to the database designers. You may go sit down with them and talk about, okay, today what system gets imported, exported, or moved between systems. That'll give you some other clues about what data should be going into this particular model. I like this model to make sure that we're even, that we've ensured we've covered all the different fields, but more importantly that I've thought about all the different business rules for each of those different data fields. Um, I had one project that I worked on it was a couple years ago now where we had a lot of requirements written out and there were a ton of business rules. Um, it was interesting because developers started complaining that they didn't have enough detail and I was just shocked. I'm like, gosh, we have so much stuff about this. Well, it turns out they weren't even looking at the data dictionary. They were looking at the requirements document, not the accompanying data dictionary that had all those rules in it. So that's a really good point that at some point you really gotta make sure your team is educated about these models, at least to know that they're there and look at them. Once they learned about it, they loved it. They were thrilled to have it already done. Um, okay, one, let's see, one quick question here that came in that I wanna answer right now is what is an associated business data object? Um, that's one of the columns here in the data dictionary. Um, and by the way, you may find that you need to add different fields to your data dictionary. Feel free to do that. There's no harm in that. Um, the associated business data object is when, if I have a business data object like customer that has an attribute, let's say address, and it turns out the address is itself an actual object of some sort, that's where I would put it here. So I would have a row of this table that would be, you know, business data object equals customer, field name equals, let's say, shipping address. I'd describe what that was. And when I get over here to associated business data object, in that field, I would put address object, or whatever I call that particular object. So great question. Next, we're gonna look at a quick example of our data dictionary. Again, this is from our online store. Um, and then this particular case, I've got the order with a shipping address. Um, and here's actually a fantastic example of the question that just came in, right? So you can see associated business data object in this case is in fact an address. I'm really very fortunate that my example worked out to show you that. Um, but that just gives you kind of the type of information you would see in a data dictionary. These usually have many, many rows, sometimes hundreds of rows. Um, for a given object, it's probably going to be like five to ten rows maybe more, depending on the complexity of the object. I like that far right column because it gives you some some place to give examples of the kinds of values that would show up in here. State table. This is actually a really fun model, I think. Um, it's a rare project where you don't actually have states transitioning that you need to model, um, but I think it's a really underused model. I'm gonna show you state table and then I'm gonna show you state diagram and we'll talk about the relationship between those because they both have a, have a valid place in a project. So first up, state table. 
And these are going to show you all the valid and invalid transitions between states for a given object in your system. And again, that object is going to look a lot like the data objects that we've been talking about. So the first thing I do is identify what are, um, what's the object that I'm going to model here. What are all the possible states? I just kind of brainstorm and get those down on paper. And once I've settled in on what the states are going to be, I put them across the top and down the left, is what you see here in the template. <clears throat> then I actually am going to literally look at every single cell in this table, and I'm going to ask, can I move from the transition on the left to the transition in the right? So I'd start with A to A. Can I move from A to A? Often that's a no. Okay, can I move from A to B? Well, in this particular case, I'm saying yes. And the words that show up in here are the event that triggers you to move from A to B. And I'll show you that again in an example. Can I move from A to C? No. Can I move from A to D? And so on. And you literally will end up considering every single cell in this particular box. Um, if you're in a situation where those transition events are really complicated and hard to type in a box, you can actually use like a requirements ID number and put that in the box and then just list out the transition events below the table. So you can get creative with this. On my first pass, I actually do yes, no. So if it's yes, then I come back and try and figure out what the event was later. Now, the thing about state tables that is really valuable is that they're going to help you ensure that all of the possible transitions are identified because you have to literally consider all of them to fill out this table. There isn't a single transition that could happen that isn't represented by a cell in this table. So that's why I like it. It's a really thorough model that lets me ensure some kind of completeness. The other thing, I'll tie this kind of back to the data for a minute. Once I have this in place, I can start to examine those transitions to figure out, are there some more detailed requirements I need to specify? So it could lead me to more requirements that way. Um, and through that, I need to be thinking what happens to the data itself during that transition. Sometimes the data changes from one object to the next because of this. So there's some interesting requirements around data that will come out of um, really diving into the depths of a model like this. So some people do prefer a more visual model than a table, and I'm going to show that to you next. Um, what I will tell you, though, <clears throat> is I still like the state table because it helps me get that completeness. Um, but let's dive into the state diagram, and then we'll look at them side by side. So state diagram, all right, so this is how we show visually those transitions between states. These are the symbols that you use. There's a start state and an end state at the bottom. Everything else is just a circle called a state, and then we have these arrows, um, that show the direction of the state transition and the words on that arrow are going to be that event that causes the um, transition. And the thing about state diagrams or state tables, the place that you're going to look to use them, anywhere that you have complicated workflow, like an approval workflow. A great example of this would be a loan application system. Watching the flow of that loan through your system, right? Those are all just different state changes or the order, state of an order as it flows through. That's kind of a trigger for you if you've got some kind of a workflow. That's a good indication you should be creating one of these models, if not both. All right, and again, I'm going to show you the templates for these side by side to show you that they actually show the, exactly the same information, just in two different ways. Now, the state diagram only shows the valid transition, so inherently it's showing the nose in that state table by simply not showing the arrow as a line. All right, and again, the difference about when I would use one another, um, state tables really want to make, really used when I want to make sure that I am considering every single state and every single state transition. The diagram is when I want to leave out all those non-transitions and just focus on the actual transitions, and it lets me kind of visualize how I would transition between these, like that sequence of transitions. It's much easier to see in the, in the diagram versus the table at the top. Okay, so the diagram is better for flow, the table is better for completeness. And what I tell people is create them both. Start with the table because it's pretty fast to create the table, but once you have the table and you go to create the diagram, the diagram literally can be made in about two minutes time once you have the table done. Here's an example, and I think somebody asked a question around what kind of state should I think of. So this is an example from like a login logout in, a, in our online store. All right, so I've got three different states, and I'm showing you the table and the diagram side by side. Um, very, very simple example. I will show you a more complicated one here in just a minute um, for our online store, but this is just showing you that, like, literally, they are showing you exactly the same information in two different ways. And in this particular case, you know, if you're logged into the system, um, 
the only state that you can transition into is being logged out and known because this is talking about having cookies in place. Okay, so here's our state table and a little bit more complex example from our online store. This is looking at the states of an order, right? So um, again, I'm thinking about my data object order. I realize it's got different states and then I start to brainstorm what the states are. I will tell you something that's very common is you will go through this process and then eventually realize I'm missing a state and that's okay. You add it on. There's no big deal about doing that. Um, I see this done in a training exercise all the time and that um, there's actually a state that some people think of and some don't, which is, you know, once the order is received, so here's the question we need to ask. That looks like a final end state in this diagram, right? You should ask the question, is that truly the end state? Once the order is received, is there no other state it could end up in? And in some scenarios, we've modeled this, and I think, um, yes, exactly. Somebody just sent the question, and this is exactly right. The order could be returned. So if an order can be returned, then this state table is incorrect. But that's the kind of just dialogue you need to have with your stakeholders. Once it's received, are we done? Well, no, it needs to be returned. Then great, we would go add an additional state to this particular model. So again, that's our state table, and here is the diagram version of it. And again, this one is showing that received is the final end state, but potentially you might actually want to add a return state onto it. And maybe you wouldn't even have an end state, like it could continue back through this life cycle potentially. The initial state and the target state are not, um, so this is a question from Art, are they always the same? They are, they are always the same in this particular model. Um, I'm going to go back to this particular diagram here to show you this. So they are always the same. And it, what the idea is you want to have a constant set of states and it needs to always be the same set of states along the left and across the top so that you can consider all the transitions between them. In reality, there's some states that you will never come back into and they're just initial states, right? And there will be other states that you leave and never end in. So it's kind of a complicated answer to Art's question, but it was a great question. All right, report table is our next and last model for today. Um, the report table, and I say this on the screen on purpose, that is a very fine print. I know you cannot all read it, um, but at the end, we'll point you to some resources where you can actually go get a bigger view of this um, to look at it later, or you can come back and get the webinar later if you want to just reference that later. And I don't know, there's a question coming in that Chris will have to answer us for at the end whether the slides are made available to you all. I've had a couple people ask that. Um, so he can address that later. I also will tell you that if for some reason they don't, I'm happy if you just shoot me an email that I will send a PDF of the slides to you. So don't hesitate to do that. Um, it takes me no time to, to, to zip that out to you. Um, so that might be a good reference for you later. Okay, report table. So this is pretty obvious, it's to capture reporting requirements. Um, we do this in a very structured format. I know that there's lots of different examples of report templates and what fields should go in them, and any of them are certainly going to be fine. Um, but the idea is you're going to look at your existing reports and figure out what you need in your new system, let's say, and you're going to fill in these fields. Or maybe you're creating a new system and trying to figure out what reports you need. This is just giving you some structure to ask questions about to make sure you listed all those detailed requirements. Um, what I will say is that there is one particular field in here I want to call your attention to that I think is the single most important field in here, and that's the third one on the upper left. It's called decisions that are made from reports. So people that I talk to, business stakeholders I talk to, tend to think that they need a lot of reports. They become like their security blanket for systems. It's like, well, I need to have these reports just in case, you know, it's particularly if they have an existing system today. And so I'm like, great, tell me what decision you're going to make from looking at that report. And if they can't, that's a great indication to me that we have scope creep and we could probably cut the report. Because people don't look at the reports for fun. They're looking at them so that they can make some kind of a business decision um, in their organization. And if they're not making a decision from it, they're not looking at it. And that decision might be to not do anything or not act, all right? So um, knowing that, just keep in mind if people are asking for a lot of reports, that field right there, that third field on there is the one that's going to be key for you to really zero in on which reports are actually going to be needed. Now, one of the things when I deliver report requirements, I like to include a sample of the report. And this could be an example from an actual 
past project, maybe you have one, maybe you can do a mock-up, like we just made a little mock-up in Excel to represent our report in this particular project. Um, you may have to do some, some drawing, some paint art, because it may include charts or things like that. So you may need to get creative with how you show the report, but give them some kind of a visual clue, not just the report table itself. Whoops, sorry, this is an example of our report table part, I should say part of the report table filled out for the online store in one particular report. All right, so in this particular case, um, you know, we're looking at cart abandonment rate. So my assumption is I have an online store and I'm paying attention to how many people come, put things in the cart, and then leave the cart and don't actually ever do the checkout. All right, so that's what this particular scenario is monitoring. And the decision I would make from looking at a report like this is deciding which parts of the checkout process need to be modified um, or removed maybe even so that I can create more seamless online shopping experience. Right, so the assumption here is I've got something broken in my checkout process and this report is helping me zero in on what is actually broken. Um, I have a great story that I like to tell about reports. I worked on a project with sales executives at a Fortune 500 company and they were building a reporting and analytics solution and they came back and told us we need 200 different reports. Well, I will tell you there were five users that were going to look at these reports. Um, of those five people, I could not envision, and these are like VPs of sale, that level, vice presidents. I'm like, there is no way that five vice presidents of sales of that big of a company are going to actually look at 200 reports. I didn't buy it. It wasn't happening. Um, and so when we went through this process with them, we were actually to, were able to really trim a lot of fat out of that list. And it was just they were used to having them just in case, but never clicked on them. Um, and so in the end, we got that 200 down to 50 actual reports that needed to be built. Now, that's my six models that I want to show you today. But I also want to pause for a minute and, and help make sure that everybody's on board. Um, I am getting some background noise, Chris. Maybe... Can check that. Yes, Joy, I'm checking on that now. Thank you. <laughs> you um, so I've talked about six different models. I've shown you a screen that tells you there's even more models than that. The really important thing to remember is that um, no one model shows it all. <laughs> uh, the, this is just an example. Maps are models. The map on the left, this is the state of Texas, which is where I live, the map on the left shows precipitation across our state. Uh, it doesn't really because we don't actually get precipitation here for the most part, but it's a mock of a state of Texas precipitation map. The map on the right actually shows uh, imaginary highways around the state. Uh, we joke that this is the map of highways to drive between vineyards in Texas, um, and you'll notice there's a big loopy highway over on the right, which is just kind of funny. But anyway, the point is you have two totally different maps here, and neither map shows everything. If you want to know something about how much it rains in Texas, the map on the right is completely useless to you. If you want to know something about how to get to a winery, the map on the left is completely useful to you. Useless to you, sorry. If you want to know the most direct way to get from point A to point B, the map on the right might be helpful to you only if points A and B are in that map though, right? If you want to get between two cities that aren't on here, then it's actually not helpful at all. So my point in showing this to you is that requirements models are exactly the same thing. It's why we have four different categories of models. You can't just look at the system from the data perspective. You also need to look at it from the systems perspective, that people perspective, and the objectives of the system, right? So it's all about looking at the different perspectives that collectively together help us understand that we have a full set of requirements defined. Let me show you a couple examples of how these models also work together. I talked about this a couple times on a couple of the different slides that they complement one another um, and where one model might be able to help you find something that's missing in another model, right? So uh, a great example here is our business data diagram. That particular model shows us all the different business data objects that are in play, but it doesn't give us that field level information at all. Whereas a data dictionary doesn't show us the relationships between objects at all, but it does give us those levels of detail about the data. So you can see these two models actually complement each other really well. And for every 
object that is in the model on the left, the BDD, you should have the fields defined in the data dictionary on the right. So again, these play very nicely together. If somebody starts talking to you about field level attributes and you go put them in the data dictionary and you try to say here's the data object it belongs to and that data object isn't there, that's a really good indication that you're probably missing something. Another example how requirements might work to, or models might work together, if I'm doing reports for a system and I'm finding that the users want to have some level of flexibility with the reports, like maybe they want to be able to drill down in the data, like an interactive experience with the reports, everybody's default answer is to go create a report table. However, that may not be sufficient. You might need to actually go create some user interface models that help describe how that, that interaction is going to actually work. Or you might need to use process flows to understand how the report's ever even going to get used in the daily life for these people. Right? So again, all these different models play together to give us that big picture. And I'm just giving you one slice today on that data perspective. So just keep that in mind. There's other models to be, to be seen out there. I've given you a lot of information today. I created a, a summary page here at this URL that you can follow that reiterates here's the six different models that I went through today. Um, you can also go download, this is what I call a cheat sheet, it's a quick reference. Um, on that cheat sheet, it's two pages long. I actually like to print it, I laminate it so I can have it on my desk and not you know, bend the corners and all that. But this is just a quick reminder of what all the different models are. And on the back side of that are all the data models that we went through today. So I know I covered a lot, but there's a good reference that you know, if you want to go back um, and learn a little bit more when you actually try to use one of these, you can. Here's my suggested reading. I'm going to just up front tell you I'm biased about both of these books because I co-authored both of these books. Um, the first one is all about visual models. We described the 22 different requirements models, including these six models in that book in a lot of depth. And then the second book is Software Requirements, the updated version, third edition came out in 2013. Um, and Carl and I worked together on that and updated the content on that. But in particular, all, all, almost all of these models are going to be in there. There's a lot of good information in general about requirements, but particularly as well about models. Um, and if you're interested, I'm, we've always got blog posts on these topics out there. I want to thank Digibytes again for sponsoring us today. Fantastic resource with loads of information. I'm sure you can find lots of data model articles out there without a doubt, just with a simple search on their site. So again, thanks to Digibytes for that. And with that, I think we have about 10 minutes I can go through some of the questions that we have here today. Um, so I got a lot of questions. If I don't get to your question, please don't hesitate to just reach out to me via email and I'll ask your question. I will happily uh, respond back to you with that, okay? Um, and please send me an email. My email address is right here on the screen. Send that to me because I won't necessarily know your email to get, to get uh, back to you. So. I'm going to just start with some of the early questions that came in when I was talking about requirements modeling language and what that is. Um, there's an interesting thing like, is it an official type of language? Is it, you know, implemented via XML or UML diagrams? So a couple people are asking questions around that. Um, so great, great question. I, um, I don't know what makes something an official language or not. We actually are talking to a couple different standards organizations about making it an official standard. Um, I can't commit to that right now by any means. But um, what I will tell you is that some of the models in the language are similar to UML and UML can be used to create them. But generally speaking, it's a much simpler language of models than UML and a lot less rigor. So when I think about things like UML, XML, BPMN, there's a very specific, I mean, there's a technical specification about how it works, um, and that's important for tools to implement. Um, but what we find is that the requirements models need a flexibility to them, because I don't ever want to have to use a particular syntax or shape because the model says I have to. I want to do it only if it's helping communicate some information in a valid way. Or I might have a guideline, a suggestion around how to use a particular model or to do something in a model, and somebody needs to break that so they can better communicate something, then they should. I never ever want to be dogmatic about these models. And so keep that in mind just in general when you're doing particularly business requirements, that type of modeling, you need to, to inherently allow for some flexibility in what you're doing. Um, and I do want to also say that there's a number of tool vendors out there that actually support doing these and that kind of flexibility in them. And so I love that about them. 
extra okay there was a question that came up in the data flow diagram from John I should have caught this when it came in sorry John but is the external entity on a data flow diagram only outside the company or can it just be outside the scope of analysis um, and that's actually I mean that's a fantastic question it's really does not have to be outside the company at all it's really just an external entity meaning it's somebody that's not part of the system themselves so it could be that you have an internal user that's interacting with the system. Absolutely, you would call that an external entity on your data flow diagram. Um, so great question. Nothing about that was meant to me that has to be external to the organization. This is an interesting question. How do you decide what state names are? So <laughs> I find that that is actually one of the hardest things about doing either a state table or a state model, or state diagram, sorry, that actually, I Identifying the states is reasonably easy, but figuring out how to name them and uniquely name them is hard. And so I like to think about, um, first of all, trying to be consistent in the names. So if I'm talking about an order, uh, maybe I want to have a state where I'm describing, hey, this thing was confirmed. I use the word like confirmed. Um, so sometimes I'm taking a verb and making it past tense because the thing has already happened. That just helps me know that, that okay, when I'm in the confirmed state, it's already confirmed. I've seen examples where maybe there's a state called confirming, like I'm in the process of confirming it, but what I don't like about that is it sounds like a very temporary state, like something's going to fly right through it. Um, so I try to, to think about the action that's happened to it when it comes to rest in that state and name it according to that. But I will tell you that that absolutely is going to take practice, and as you have, um, work with a particular model, you can try some different names on, and some will feel intuitive and some won't. Um, and maybe get some other people like your stakeholders to tell you what they think the words are. That may help kind of zero in on what's going to work in your organization. When would you have a transition from A to A? Great question from Tom. Like you're in a state model. This is a tough one. Um, if you're in a particular state, would you ever transition and end up in that same state? Generally speaking, I find the answer to that is no. That, you know, it's not like an actual thing happens and I end up back where I started. But I, and I wish I could come up with an example off the top of my head. Um, if somebody comes up with one, they can type it in the window and I can share it with you all. But it's really, um, you know, like if you're in a case where you literally do take a physical action and you can end up in maybe three different places and one of those places is right back where you started, then, um, that's possible. I feel like there's some kind of a board game that probably does that, as I was describing that out loud. <laughs> ah, okay, great. See, I'm getting some examples. Thanks, guys. This is perfect. So Brad says, hit the reset, restart button. If in startup, then you're back there. So that was good. I like that. Okay, here's another one from John. After three days, send a reminder email, but the state is still the same. Right? So you sent the email, you did some kind of action, but you stayed in that state that might be... Um, need to remind or something like that. Login is unsuccessful, still in the login state. Fantastic, guys. Thanks for helping me on the fly with some, some ideas around that. Um, okay, John, you have a great point that sometimes states actually, um, business, your business stakeholders, your customer stakeholders may already have their own lingo for those states. And in that case, you should use those those names as best you can. And, you know, if they're not intuitive, then create a little table off of the side that just elaborates on what the state means. There's no harm in doing that. But I think that you want to try and zero in on that. And then Kent actually had a really good clarification that the state is really the noun, and the trigger uh, that shows up on the arrow between them, that's the action, and that is correct, Kent. Well done. So are there any online resources which detail examples of all the models, including UML, for the same case study? You know, great, that's a good question. I don't know one that does all of the other models out there. I really only know um, for the requirements models that we use, I know that our book uses the same scenario for all of the examples. We use that online store. Um, you can, if you go to our website, you can actually download a full set of models templates, and, and each of those templates has an example in it that's all from the online store. But we don't have all the UML examples in there by any means, and I don't know of a particular resource for that that would be useful if anybody comes across one. Um, there are tons of tools, Klaus asks about tools that support RML. Um, all of, we've done a pretty thorough evaluation of requirements management tools. Um, I made that available on our website for people who, if you want to look at it, it's 
it's done in a way you could actually prioritize the features yourself and, and rank tools. Um, I don't want to sit here and, for, you know, support one particular tool. I love lots of different tools and different vendors out there. Um, but what I will tell you is if you look for requirements management tools, um, there are a handful of different ones that really do support visual modeling in different ways. And that is one of the top features we look at in a tool. If that's something where you really do want to know some of the specific choices of tools, um, shoot me an email and I will happily share with you our study, our details around that, and give you some direction on which ones I would point you to because I do think there's some really good ones out there. And, and I will say that five years ago, I had a hard time saying that, but they've gotten really, really good um, at actually supporting modeling compared to where they used to be, maybe seven, eight years ago. Um, Sue points out shapes in Visio, absolutely. Um, we actually created our own Visio templates. Again, those are a download, you can grab them, or if you can't find them, email me and I'll send you the set of templates. The set of templates is all in Microsoft Office products, so they're Visio, Coupler, and Excel, things like that. Um, and Tom is asking, is your survey updated? <laughs> we are in the process of updating our survey right now, so I would expect sometime in the next few months we'll actually have an updated version of the tool survey. And with that, I think we might be pretty close to the top of the hour. So Chris, I'm going to hand it back to you. If I didn't get to your question, just certainly shoot me an email, and I will be happy to try and address it offline. Okay. And thanks for the participation, guys. <laughs> yeah, lots of participation today. Thanks, Joy. Uh, very informative presentation. This concludes today's event. Have a great day.